I am starting this video in my car because I want you to consider a question. Can car makers force drivers to wear their seat belt? I normally wear my seat belt, but for this example, I am sitting in a parking lot. I'm not going to be out driving on the road without my seat belt. Uh, I'm certainly not going to be recording videos out on the road. I'm sitting in a parking lot with my car running, but I do not have my seat belt on. And what I want to do is just illustrate what happens when I put my car in drive and drive across the parking lot. Other than the fact my camera is probably going to shift a little bit. I'm going to try and hold it steady as I drive. But here we go. I'm driving across the parking lot. And if you can hear that sound, that is a chime going off. My car is creating an unpleasant acoustic environment because it's trying to convince me to put my seatbelt on. I have two options. The car is forcing a choice on me. I can either continue driving without a seatbelt and listen to this noise, or I can immediately stop that noise by putting on a seatbelt. Ta-da! I'm sure your car probably works the same way. The point I'm trying to make is that my car didn't actually force me to put my seatbelt on, but what it did is it encouraged me, and I'll put that in air quotes. My car encouraged me to put my seatbelt on by creating an acoustic environment that was kind of annoying until I did what the car wanted me to do, for my own good, of course. I am Dr. John Padfield. I'm a business professor and a former Indiana state representative, and this is Business Reform, where we discuss issues at the intersection of business, technology, and society. My brief demonstration in my car was an example of what is called a nudge. In 2008, University of Chicago economist and Nobel laureate Richard Thaler co-authored a book with Harvard Law professor Cass Sunstein. Their book was entitled Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness. This book helped popularize the concept of nudges, which they defined as, quote, any aspect of choice architecture that alters people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. They further explain to count as a mere nudge, the intervention must be easy and cheap to avoid. Nudges are not taxes, fines, subsidies, bans, or mandates. In the first chapter of their book, they discuss how a public school cafeteria experimented with where different food items, such as fruit and junk food, were placed, and how various placements impacted sales of those foods. They state, quote, putting fruit at eye level counts as a nudge, banning junk food does not. Nudges do not compel nor prohibit people from making certain choices. They simply increase or decrease the likelihood of someone making a certain choice. I can give you a very personal example of just how simple and effective nudges can be. I did not use Twitter until after Elon Musk purchased it and rebranded it as X. When I first downloaded and started using X, I started spending more time on the app. I was not consciously choosing to spend extended periods of time on the app. I was unconsciously spending too much time on it. When I finally realized how much time I was spending, I knew I needed to do something, but what would it take to change my months-long social media usage pattern? Did I need to delete the app from my phone or delete my X account entirely? For me, the answer was no. The solution was all I needed was a nudge. I simply removed the app from my phone's home screen and put it in a folder on a different screen. I still had the option of opening and using X anytime I wanted, but by simply removing it from my home screen, my usage of the app instantly dropped by about 95%. The idea of nudges has been around much longer than the book. When you do something as simple as go to the grocery store, you are subjected to all types of nudges to encourage you to purchase more than you intended. For example, walk into nearly any grocery store and the first thing you will see is usually produce followed by the bakery because seeing fresh fruit and vegetables and smelling baked goods appeals to your sense of sight and smell and encourages you to buy more food. 
In psychology, this practice is called priming, and I have included a link to an article about that in the description of this video. Most grocery stores are laid out in rows with meat, which happens to be a higher margin food category, usually taking up most of the back wall at the end of the aisles, so no matter which aisle you walk down, you encounter the meat section. Dairy products are usually on the back wall of the grocery store in the corner furthest from the entrance, thereby assuring that you will have to walk past literally thousands of other food products you are not looking for to buy the couple of items that you went to the store for in the first place. Then there are the end caps, where stores often place high-margin items, or sometimes items near their expiration date, because they know more people will see and therefore be more likely to purchase them. And of course there is the cereal aisle, where cereals stocked at eye level sell in much higher volumes than cereals sold on shelves above or below eye level. Of course cereal for kids with brightly colored mascots on the box dominate the lower shelves because they are at eye level for kids. The point of this video is not to pick on grocery stores. They are simply laying out their stores in a way to encourage sales. The layout of their stores, the lighting, the smells, the sounds that you experience when you go to the store, they are all designed as nudges to encourage you to purchase more, especially impulse purchases, and it works extremely well. According to an October 2020 article published in the Journal of Business and Retail Management Research, which examined the effect of in-store product displays and relocation of product, the impact is huge. The research found, quote, Compared to the control group, the treated products placed in display boxes show a statistically significant increase in sales. The precise effect differs markedly between the investigated products, ranging from 80% to 478%. I do not have any problem with grocery stores using these techniques or nudges to encourage shoppers to buy more. However, there are other companies that use more manipulative nudges, and I do have a problem with some of their techniques, but that is a topic for a future video. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and give it a like, and thank you for watching.